thank you all for joining us tonight. We're so excited to have you here. Um, for those of you that are joining us on YouTube or Facebook, um, we think it'd be kind of fun and we'd love if you could drop a comment to let us know where you're joining us from. Tonight, uh, we want to start out the evening by asking you to take a brief pause um, to recognize the current state of our country. Um, in this moment of silence, we really just want to take some time to, to let us grieve for all that we have, all the people that we have lost and all the people who have lost loved ones um, due to COVID-19, and especially those who continue to suffer from the disproportionate impacts that this pandemic is having on communities of color, um, our Black, Brown, and Indigenous brothers and sisters. Finally, um, let us honor the lives of George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, Ahmaud Arbery, and all the others killed in police shootings and other racially driven murders. Thank you, Kate. So um, we're hoping that tonight will be a night, um, you know, to allow us to inform ourselves um, about some environmental justice issues and also just take a minute for healing and just to celebrate all the great work that's being done um, in our communities. So we're gonna start out with a um, virtual art gallery, which highlights our People Who Make a Difference poster project. And then after that, we're going to join in conversation with Karen Washington and some young people from Newburgh Free Academy's P-TECH program and from the Kingston YMCA Farm Project. And then we'll end our night um, with some songs for change and healing curated by DJ Tim McQueen and Envia Sound. Uh, but first, let's go ahead and take a walk through our virtual gallery. Hi, I'm Kate Phipps, Scenic Hudson's Education and Community Engagement Coordinator. Today we're going to take you on a tour of our virtual gallery. But before that, before we do that, I want to give you a little bit more background and tell you about the project. Um, as a classroom teacher and an environmental educator, I saw a real lack of environmental role models, specifically environmental role models from underrepresented group. So looking at black people, indigenous people, other people of color, women and youth. Because there weren't really role models from these underrepresented groups, I saw a need to highlight their contributions to the environmental movement. Last year, I was lucky to have Priya James come and work with me. She's a Student Conservation Association member with the Hudson Valley Corps. And the skills and the energy that she brought helped to develop the People Who Make a Difference poster series. The poster series honors modern environmental change makers who we really feel haven't received as much recognition as they deserve. We partnered with Dutchess Community College's service learning program to create these posters. And so we want to send a big thank you over to the Dutchess Community College service learning program, as well as Holly McCabe, who is a graphics design professor who kind of helped us navigate this project, um, and the students whose hard work and vision really make the posters what they are and the amazing pieces of work that we have today. Um, I will say that you can visit our website to find out more um, about these poster subjects as well as the project. Um, if you go to scenichudson.org backslash people dash who dash make dash a dash difference, um, you can find information on how to access the gallery as well as you know, information on the poster subjects. So we hope you'll go check it out. But with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Priya who's gonna show you how to navigate the gallery. Hi, my name is Priya James. I am the Education and Community Engagement Assistant here at Scenic Hudson. I'm also a member of the Student Conservation Association, um, Hudson Valley Corps and AmeriCorps. So today I'm gonna to take y'all on a little tour of our virtual gallery for the People Who Make a Difference poster project. The great thing about the virtual gallery is that it gives you kind of that experience of being in an actual art gallery, um, but you can experience it from the comfort of your own home. So there are a few different ways that we navigate our gallery. Um, the first way is just by using your mouse to click any location in the gallery. Um, the second way is to use your arrow keys on your keyboard. So you can use your right, left, front, and back keys to navigate through the virtual gallery space. 
Um, you can also use the Q and E keys on your keyboard to rotate your view. So the Q key will rotate your view to the left and the E key will rotate your view to the right. Um, so if you check out the bottom left corner here, we also have a map. You can click anywhere in that map and it'll take you to that location in the virtual gallery space. Um, you also have the option to do a guided tour. You can do that by hitting play right here. Um, and that will just take you through a guided tour of each individual poster on a self timer. Um, so you can sit back and enjoy the gallery space that way if you prefer. Um, we also have this drop down menu right here. So the drop down menu has a list of all of our individual posters. So if you like to skip ahead or go back to a specific poster, you can use this drop down menu to do that. All right. So um, what I will do is go ahead and go to one of our posters. Um, so this is Karen Washington. Karen is a farmer and food justice activist and she's based in the South Bronx um, here in New York. So um, Karen is one of the really special activists that we're highlighting in this project. And she's also extremely special because um, we're highlighting her in our virtual event. Um, so you can click directly on any of the posters in the gallery and that will pull up um, the text for you to read and get a better look at. And it'll also pull up um, a bio for the student artist that created the poster. So this poster was created by Nicole Medina, a student at Dutchess Community College. Um, Nicole is actually from the South Bronx, just like Karen is. So that's a really, really special connection that the two of them just so happen to share. Um, so you can check out Karen's poster text and Nicole's bio right here in this box. Um, and then we can hit X to go away from that. So at any point in the gallery, you can click on a poster to view it in more detail and to check out that artist's bio. So if we look down here in the bottom left corner at our map, you'll notice that there are four rooms here. So each of those rooms is focused on a different um, kind of area that our featured activists work in. Um, those areas are farming and food justice, climate change, green spaces, clean water, and environmental justice. So right now I'll go ahead and navigate us to one of those rooms. So this is our farming and food justice room. It gives you a little bit more information about the topic and about what food, um, food justice is. And then inside the room, it kind of gives you some images to help you visualize the topic. All right, so I will navigate us back to the beginning here. Great, so this has been a short tour of our People Who Make a Difference virtual gallery. Um, I hope that you will come visit the gallery on your own time and, and enjoy everything that it has to offer. You can access the virtual gallery and just find out more about the People Who Make a Difference poster project on our website, and that's www.scenichudson.org. Thank you. All right, awesome. So. Um, I hope that you all will go back to the virtual gallery and check that out on your own time. And that's on our website at scenichudson.org. Um, so now I'm gonna go ahead and do some introductions. Um, firstly, it's a real, real honor for me to introduce Karen Washington, who is one of our people who make a difference poster subjects. Um, so a little bit about Karen. For the last 35 years, um, she's been a vocal and active advocate for promoting urban farming. Um, as a way for New Yorkers to access fresh locally grown food. Um, among Karen's many accomplishments, she's a board member and former president of the New York Community Garden Coalition, um, which was established to preserve community gardens. She also co-founded um, BUGS, or the Black Urban Growers Network, um, which is an organization of volunteers committed to building networks and community support for growers in both urban and rural settings. Um, in 2012, Ebony Magazine named Karen one of the 100 most influential African Americans in the country. And in 2014, she received the James Beard Leadership Award. Um, also in 2014, she retired from her longtime day job as a physical therapist to um, start Rise and Root Farm in Chester, New York. Um, the farm is actually located at the Chester Agricultural Center, whose land Cena Cutson has helped to conserve. Um, so together with her partners, Karen is working on and beneath 
the ground at Rise and Root um, to build a strong local ag community and promote food justice in New York City by providing access to the farm's bounty. So we're really grateful to have Karen here tonight um, to kind of share her experiences um, in advocacy and agriculture as a Black woman to provide advice for aspiring young farmers and um, to offer some suggestions about how we can further support Black farmers. Um, I'd also like to introduce our um, panelists. So we have Alana and Zoe, who are both current students in the P-TECH program at Newburgh's Free Academy. Um, we also have Kimora, Isaiah, Estefany, and Caleb, who are students or alumni from Kingston High School, um, who have all participated in programming with the Kingston YMCA Farm Project. These students were selected to be a part of tonight's conversation because they've already exemplified um, a very serious commitment to being actively involved in their communities and they already show a very inspiring level of community engagement. So thank you to all the panelists for being here. Um, it's a real honor for me to be included in this group of people tonight. Um, so the questions that we're gonna be discussing tonight were written by some local students that we've worked with. Um, and we'll kind of get the questions rolling. I believe Alana has our first question. Hi, so um, my question is for Karen. And um, basically I have heard your, um, you tell your stories of, about being inspired by your parents cooking and also the power of fresh produce. What do you think, uh, when do you think you become an activist or what was your call to action? Well, thank you so much uh, for that question, Alana. Um, people ask me that question time and time again. And for me, it was back in 1998 after getting my hands involved in community gardening when the mayor at that time, Giuliani, wanted to auction off 100 community gardens. It was devastating because prior to that, many community gardens took over empty lots that the city could not maintain. And so we felt it was our rite of passage to take care of those gardens, to make sure that we could grow food for our communities. And then when the mayor, who was part of the city, went behind our back in the middle of the night to try to open, to try to um, auction off 100 community gardens, there were two things that we could do, either be silent and complacent or fight back. And I decided, along with so many uh, community gardens, started to fight back. And that's when I found my voice. Awesome. Thank you, Karen. All right. So our next question is going to be Caleb. Awesome. Thank you. Uh, let's see. Let me pull up the question. So, um, so the question I have here is, uh, what's one challenge that you have faced and overcame on the journey to where you are now? Uh, I think the challenge of being insecure and not... Um, have confidence in myself. Um, you know, I, I've come from a long legacy of, of, of Black people here in the United States. And um, racism really was at the forefront um, along the way. I was subjected to um, racism based on the color of my skin. And so you always felt that you always had to do better. You had to do better, better than the next person in order to achieve, in order to be seen. And for me, the challenge was, I have to be the best person that I can be. I have to believe in myself and not be dictated what others might perceive I should be or what I should want to be. I had to develop that confidence that I am the person that I am, that I mean something, that I have a voice, and I have to have that self-confidence. So I think overcoming that shyness, overcoming that insecurity for me was really, really great. Great question. Thank you. All right, awesome. Thank you, Karen, and thank you, Caleb. All right, so our next question um, is actually for the students. Um, so what is an issue or something that you've seen that makes you want to speak up and create change? And anyone can go first. <laughs> so um, one of the many issues that made me want to speak up and create change 
is the injustice in our justice system right now, um, particularly police brutality. Um, we seem to like be dealing with this for a long time and I feel like the issue has gotten to a point where we need change. And um, I think our young people are the people to do it, so. That's great, thank you, Kimora. Um, Let's see, what about uh, Stephanie? You wanna tell us about? Okay, hi everyone. Um, so there's a lot of things that I wish I could change. But something that I've seen is like um, in Texas, the ICE deten detention centers with like a bunch of families in there, like how they're treated. And I just like, I want to change that because that's not fair. Like they're humans and no humans like should be treated like that. Like everybody should have something to eat and like sleep somewhere good and like, and like with everything going around, especially COVID, like, and it's not sanitary and a lot of kids and like parents are dying and I just think that needs to change them. It makes me want to speak up. Thank you so much, Stephanie. Yeah, that's a really, really serious issue that we're, that's still happening in the midst of everything else that's happening. Um, all right, what about Isaiah? You want to go next? Uh, uh, yeah, uh, one issue that um that i would like to see change is the problem with our immigration and how how badly immigrants are treated yeah that's another great one thank you isaiah um what about zoe you want to go next An issue I've thought about lately is poverty, especially during this pandemic, because it's important to think about it. And um, people who have like low income and everything haven't been able to get like the resources they need due to COVID. Okay, thank you so much, Zoe. Um, and then let's go Caleb and then Alana. Cool. Um, like Mo said, uh, recently, you know, race relations and, uh, you know, police brutality has been heavy on my mind. Um, in Kingston, we actually, we just had a protest recently. And, uh, so, I mean, that was, that was heavy for me. Um, it's been subject I, I've been uh, studying quite a bit recently. Um, other things, uh, I'm, I'm homeschooled. I, uh, I've, been homeschooled pretty much all my life. I, uh, uh, I've, I've actually lobbied a few times for, for homeschooling and I, uh, I, I want that protected as much as it can because I think it's a, it's a great opportunity and it's a great, you know, uh, I don't want to say substitute, but it's a great um, alternative and, and schooling and I, I appreciate it for the world and I, I'd love that to be protected. Thank you, Caleb. And then Alana, last but certainly not least. <laughs> um, so I'd have to say um, like how Caleb and Kamora said, uh, Black Lives Matter and like racism because it's something that um, has been really like happening in the world and it's like really starting to come to light, like all the events that have occurred. So I think um, that's something that I would wanna speak up about and um, make like a change about, so that'd be fine. That's great. Thank you, Alana. And I meant to say also, Karen, if you'd like to respond to any of the students or what they said, please feel free. Go ahead. Yeah, well, it's interesting to hear um, what they have to say because this is the generation. They're seeing racial inequity right before their eyes. Um, they have been exposed to so many issues along racial lines. And so the ball is in their court to speak up to demand change, to make sure that with the marches that we're doing is not a one-time stand, that we continue to march and we continue to fight for equity in this country because we have a right to be here, we have a right to be treated and uh, correctly, and we have a right for our voices to be heard. So I am I feel privileged that I'm here with you tonight speaking on these crucial issues that affect all of us. Thank you so much, Karen. Yeah, it's great to hear, you know, kind of 
all of these different generations talking about these issues it's it's so important and this is definitely you know hopefully this conversation can serve serve as a call of action um, or call to action to to a lot of us um, all right so next up i believe isaiah has a question to ask um karen my question is the COVID-19 pandemic is highlighting many issues that have been around for a long time, including racial inequality and food access. With this in mind, what do you hope to see happening with farming and food justice in the post-COVID world? Great question, Isaiah. Thanks for asking me because I've been working for food justice for such for such a long time. Because as a physical therapist, my prior um, profession, I saw the interaction between food and health. And I also realized that as black and brown people got away from the land, they became sick and started to have these preconditioning, uh, pre-existing conditions such as type 2 diabetes, hypertension, obesity. And so what this pandemic has done is highlight, highlight the inequities that we see in the food system and how before COVID that it was affecting brown and brown and black people in low income neighborhoods and neighborhoods of color throughout the country. And so what I want to see post COVID, first of all, the fact that what this pandemic has done is it's been an equalizer because it has it has hit black white poor rich in between that's number one so you see so many people out of jobs and so many people for the first time going to food pantries and soup kitchens and food lines where you would mostly see low-income neighborhoods and neighborhoods of color on the food lines so you're seeing an array of people now on food lines. That's number one. So right then and there, people understand the importance of food. What I want people to understand is after this pandemic is, again, who's growing the food and are farmers and farm workers treated humanely? Are we being paid a fair amount of, of money and resources for the food that we grow? that people understand how critical is food is, farming is, because at the end of the day, you can't eat a car, you can't eat gold, you can't eat diamond, you can't eat that Samsung phone or iPhone. But the, the fact of the matter is the most important thing that people are starting to realize is food. And so I hope that people understand and really, really participate in uh, bringing up and rising up farmers, farm workers, the people that are in the trenches growing the food so that you can eat healthy. And this is not a one-time thing. Please don't let it be a one-time thing. I want people to be able to go visit farms and get involved in, in community gardens. What this pandemic also has done is that so many people now for the first time are taking their hands and want to grow food, either on their windowsill, they're growing herbs, they want to grow food down in their front yards, in their backyards. The seed companies can't even keep seeds now. You see Home Depot and Lowe's, everybody's going now to grow something because they know now when we call, talk about essential, the essentials of growing food is so, so important. So thank you so much for bringing that up because it seemed like for years I've been screaming and screaming to the rooftops the importance of food and the relationship between food and health. And if we as a society understand that when it comes to food, food is a human right. Every individual should have a right to fresh food that is healthy, that is local, that doesn't have pesticide or insecticides. And so if we can do that, if we can do that, we can heal this nation and people will be better off. Thank you for that question. Very, very good. Thank you, Karen. And I'll also add, um, if any of my students have 
anything they want to say in response or anything that made you think of or any comments or anything like that definitely feel free to um unmute yourself and you can you can say what what you want can i just ask a question to one of the students to the students in general is anyone growing food is anyone growing food every hand should be up come on who's isaiah zoe every is everyone growing food oh. is everyone eating food everyone hand is up there so just make sure another thing on uh, advice is this is your time youth is that when you go into a grocery store the question should ask where did that food come from who grew it and was it sprayed with pesticides or insecticides ask the produce manager those questions because you should demand those answers and if he can't answer those questions then they need help and maybe you can help them yeah thank you karen all right, does any, any of my students have anything you wanna say before we jump to our next question? I'll kind of take a pause here for a second. All right, cool. So um, our next question, I believe is Zoe. Hello, my question is, how has being a black woman informed and affect your work? So, Zoe, when you look at me, what's the first thing you see? The color of my skin, right? I don't even have to say anything. I walk in a door, you walk in a store, right? You walk in a store, you walk in, a, 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 in any sort of situation. The first thing, they don't know I went to school, graduated with honors, have degrees, make a good living, am a good person. The first thing that I'm judged by is the color of my skin and for years that has been a problem for so so many people so many people the color of my skin that's number one also my gender being a being black but being a black woman and so what i have done for myself is internalize that as being very powerful because I learned long ago that I stand on the shoulders of greatness, that I come from kings and queens, and I learned to appreciate the color of my skin. And now as a farmer, when I'm out there in the fields and my hands are in the soil, I say, I look at my skin color, I look at the hue of my skin color, and I say, it's the color of soil. It's the color of soil. And for me, it's that sense of belonging. And so every black woman that's on this call, I want you to feel the same feeling that I feel as a black woman, to be proud, to understand your history, your legacy, how you come from royalty, and to continue to bring that brightness, to shine that beacon for all the world to see and be proud of who we are as black, strong women. And I pass that on to you all on this call. Thank you, Karen. I, gosh, I love that so much. I need a shirt that says, I stand on the shoulders of greatness. I need that on a t-shirt. Um, wow, awesome. So, um, anybody have anything they want to interject before we move on to our next question? All right, awesome. So, um, next up, uh, Stephanie has a question for Karen. Okay, hi, Karen. So my question is, do you have advice for young people who want to get more involved in a cause or how people can support youth in finding their voice? What advice that I have? Let me tell you something. I, back in the day, right now we're going through a movement, the movement of change. And for years, what has stagnated a movement is silence and complacency. You know, we get rubbed up and everybody want to march and holler this and that. And then all of a sudden we go back. And then there's silence. And there's complacency. And everything goes back to the status quo without change. You all are in a moment of time for change. You cannot allow, like Reverend Al said, you cannot allow to have that knee on our necks. No more. 
And so you have to be proactive constantly. When you see injustice, you must shout it out. When you see things that are wrong, be brave enough to say it's wrong. This is your moment. This COVID and this racial injustice that you're seeing before your eyes is a moment where the youth have to say, as an elder, your burden has been long and heavy. Give us this burden. Give us this torch so that we may carry on the legacy of so many people before you who have been fighting for justice. This is your moment to carry that torch. But the difference this time is that you're not going to back down. You're not going to be silent. You're not, being, you're not going to be complacent. That you now have a voice and you have a voice for change. Because let me tell you all, we ain't going back. We ain't going back pre-COVID because COVID has changed everything. So we can't go back because everybody knows who the essential are. Everybody knows who the hard workers are. Everybody knows now, before their eyes, what makes this country run. It's people of color. And now, what you see is for so many years, people of, of color have been battling racial injustice. And so now is the time for us, especially you youth, to stand up, step out, and don't back down. Do not let, when the crowds die down and there's no more marching, do not let up. Do not let up. Do not let, let up. Thank you so much. That was absolutely excellent question. Thank you so much, Karen. I hope we all heard that. I hope we did. Um, all right, so our next question, Kamora has a question for Karen. Hi, Karen. So you founded the organization Black Urban Growers, which provides a support network for Black farmers and growers. How can society support Black people and other people of color becoming farmers? And why is it important to specifically support these people in becoming farmers? tell you about why, how uh, Black uh, Urban Girls got um, started. So in 2008, I went away to California to sort of hone my skills in learning how to grow organically. I lived in a tent for six months, learning how to grow food. But while I was there, I got a chance to look at the landscape of farming. And we would go visit different farms, the question that I ask is, where are the farmers that look like me? Where, the question that where are the farmers that look like me? How can I be in farming? Where are the farmers that look like me? So happened to do a workshop. The question that I was asking the workshop was, what is the plight of the black farmers? And to get that information, I had to go to the census. So at that time, it was, the, I think, the 2012 census. And I wanted to know in New York State, how many black farmers there were. I found out from the census, out of 56,000 farmers, only 116 were black. Hold it, wait a second, what? And so I stood there tears streaming because no one ever talked about our plight as black people and black farmers. And so in 2010, we started this conference. When I went to white people to ask for help, I was told black people don't want to farm. All they want to do is play basketball and play music. And so our friends, we got together and we put on the first black farmers in urban Ghana conference in New York City. We had over 500 people because it was the first time that a conference was done specifically with black intelligence, knowledge, workshop, panelists, everybody was black. 
the first time young people got a chance to see an array of black farmers throughout the country. The first time they were talking about issues that were affecting our people for the first time with our reference. And so starting black urban growers continues to, for me, to have that avenue where we can get together, black, uh, get black people together to talk about the issues that pertain to our, 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 our being. Fast forward, this year would have been our 10th anniversary. We've been celebrating our 10th anniversary, but things have changed. So we're gonna try to maybe do it virtually, do some workshops and do some webinars. But it's so important that we continue to have these conversations about black agriculture, black farmers, because now in 2020, the 2017 census says in New York State, there are 57,000 farmers, but only 139 are black. We got work to do, folks, because you can't talk about a food and farming system that don't have our faces. Because let me tell y'all, the reason why we was brought here, enslaved, chains on our necks and our wrists and our feet was not because we were dumb, not because we were strong, we were brought here because of our knowledge of agriculture. This country could not survive without us because we had the skills that the colonists did not have. We had the skills to grow food and grain in a swampy climate that they weren't used to. We brought seeds in our hair from Africa to grow the food that fed us and the colonists. And so once you tell young black people what their importance is in the development of this country, they walk around proud because without us, this country could not exist. We invented a lot of the, uh, the uh, agricultural tools that are being used, but that was not taught, taught to me in school. The reference around food was always slavery which meant I meant nothing to this country. But now the lies, the lift, the, 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 our eyes have been opened. The veil has been lifted. We are proud people. We are an agrarian people. Farming is in our DNA as black and brown people. And once you know that, you stand up tall, and you demand justice, you demand access to land, you demand access to ability to, to grow your own food or to support black farmers and brown farmers. But this is our destiny. This is who we are. And we will continue to fight to make sure that there is equity within this country that 139 black farmers in New York State is unacceptable. Wow, thank you so much, Karen, for that. Um, and I did act, want to ask you one follow-up question. So when we talk about, you know, those, those 136 Black farmers in New York State, what are those main kind of hurdles that they're facing? Is it access to land? Is it financial support? What, what, are, what are those? So the census, it was in 2017. It is now 2020. We've been trying to find out who the 139 are. We don't even know if right now, if there are 120, 139. We have formed a New York State Black Farmers Group. It's about 20 of us, 20 of us, trying to reach out and locate those farmers. Because according to the census, and you may, may or may not know this, there's always Privacy Act. You know, there's privacy so you just can't go in and ask the man, I want their name, telephone number, and their farm. But we're trying to break those systems. We're trying to break that system because for us, what we're hearing for black people, the difficulty of, of, of accessing land, because for us, it was advisory roof farm, it was that difficulty, access to land, access to capital. Because if you don't have good credit, 
you can't get nothing. You know what I'm saying? So even if you are a struggling farmer and you are late paying your bills, that is a mark against your credit. So either the next time you don't get credit or you get credit with such a high interest that you can never pay it back. And the last thing, opportunities. There's so many grants that are out there, but you need a daggone college degree and a PhD to go through those grants. And so, again, when we talk about racial equity, when we talk about what has happened to us, again, there's always obstacles in our way to prevent us from trying to be the best we can and to have that opportunity. I tell people, if you want to help black and brown people, give us three things. Give us opportunity. Give us land. Give us capital or resources. You give us those three things and people who you once thought was powerless become powerful. Thank you so much, Karen. Um, so our last question here um, is going to be for our students. So the question is, how can adults and organizations best support you in finding your activist voice? Um, and I guess we can start off with Alana here. OK, um, I think like the best way they can do it um, would be kind of educating themselves and like our cause, I guess you could say like understanding like what um, we're like protesting or like trying to like make a change for it to kind of like, I guess like better understand it would be my. All right, thank you, Alana, that's awesome. All right, and I'll just go in order here on my screen. Um, Isaiah? Uh, I think one way is that adults, um, can help us by listening to us and sharing their experience and thoughts. Awesome, thank you, Isaiah. Um, Stephanie? So I think one way they can help us or support our cause is to educate themselves about like what we're trying to get across and, um, and just be there for us and like, just fight with us to change. Awesome. Thank you, Stephanie. Um, Caleb, you're next. Yeah, sure. Um, before I actually I answer that, I actually, I, I'd like to thank you, Karen. Um, my dad is in the other room and he's he's currently cheering. There's a bit of a delay. He's also from the Bronx. So like, as soon as you said that, he's like, woo, BBX. And so he was, he was all happy about that one. Um, yeah. <laughs> and uh, so um, thank you. Thank you. It's been, it's been a blast thus far. Um, but to answer the question as well, um, I think I've been very blessed um, to have a lot of, um, you know, uh, adults in my life who've supported me. And uh, I think many of us here in the Farm Project as well, Susan, this has been a great support to all of us. And um, so I'm, I'm very, I'm very happy for that. Um, but I think the way that um, adults can help further is that those adults who are supporting us um, can talk to other adults their age who may not understand our plight and, you know, make that connection, if you will. That's great, Caleb. Thank you. Yeah, it's several, several of you guys mentioned about, you know, adults educating themselves, but then it's also important that they take that education and educate other adults as well. Um, Zoe, you want to go ahead? A way that um, adults can best support us as the youth is by what Alana said and what Caleb said, by educating ourselves and as well by educating themselves and then passing on the information because then the more information that everybody gets we can all like help each other and then also say through protesting they can protest with us so they can understand like how it is on the inside instead of from what the news portrays or anything 
Thank you, Zoe. And then last but not least, Kimura. Um, I think adults can have um, an open mind to what we're fighting for, and they could kind of be on the front lines with us because they're the adult. A lot of adults are um, raised with this like mindset of their generation, but now that we're in the new generation, they need to listen to us and be there on the front lines because I know a lot of people watch the news and all the false media that goes out. So I feel like being there and keeping an open mind are like two of the most important things that they could do. Awesome. Thank you so much, Kimora. And Karen, do you have anything that you want to add? Yeah, first of all, this has been an absolute pleasure speaking with all of you. I get chills when I see so many enthusiastic young people that want to get involved and want to do the work. And as an elder, you brought up uh, a lot of things that I try to talk to my other elders because sometimes, you know, we stubborn. Y'all know we stubborn. We said in our ways, you know, we don't want to, you know, we want things our way. So I try to tell a lot of the elders, I said, first of all, yo, we, we got to listen to them. We got to listen to our youth. That's number one. Number two, we have to support the work that you're doing. And number three, the hardest thing is get out of the way. Let us get out of the way so you can flourish because we were, we were like you at one time too. So we know how it was. And so we have to remind ourselves that the youth are innovative. They need support. We need to listen and we need to get out of their way. Awesome. Thank you. All right, so um, before we kind of wrap things up, I want to open it up if any of the students have anything they want to say, anything they want to say to Karen, anything they want to say in general before we, before we get out of here. Um, I just wanted to say um, that uh, thank you so much, Karen, and um, a lot of what you said really inspired me today, so I just want to say I appreciate that. Um, so thank you. You're quite welcome. I want to say thank you for um, taking time out of your day to come talk with us today. It was very like inspirational to hear what you had to say, especially as a Black girl in America. It's important to hear things like this. Thank you, Alana and Zoe. Anybody else have anything they want to add? I'll go. Um, I just want to thank you for educating me more on black farmers because I didn't really know anything about farming or black people in the farming community. So it really opened my eyes to a lot of things and I definitely will start paying attention to where I get my food from or how I get it or where it's grown or who is growing it. So thank you. Excellent. Thank you, Kamora. Anyone else? Isaiah? I'll go. Uh, thank you for answering our questions today. You're quite welcome. They were, they were very, very hard questions. I had to think a lot about what I had to say. All right. Anyone else have anything they want to add before we wrap it up? Oh, Caleb, yep. Uh, yeah. Um, so, uh, Kimora, uh, Isaiah, and myself, we were on a uh, youth design team for uh, a, a forgotten burial ground, an African burial ground on Pine Street. And uh, so some of the conversation that we had today, um, you know, it, it was, it's a great reminder for some of the things that we learned in that process. Um, I, love, I love the story about the seeds and the hair because I think um, it's such a tribute to the resiliency of, of you know, African people and uh, all that. So thank you so much for, you know, being passionate about it and, uh, and saying some passion in us. Definitely. All right, awesome. Yeah, I love that, Caleb, inciting some passion. That's a great way to put it. Um, all right, anything else anyone else wants to add? All right, well, thank you so much to Karen, first of all. Um, thank you so much for being here. Your words were truly inspiring is not even the word. I actually was trying to keep myself from crying while you were talking. Um, so thank you so much for everything. Thank you so much. Um, to all the students here from NFA p -Tech and um, from the YMCA Farm Project, thank you for being here. Thank you for, for participating. Um, we hope that these conversations 
um, kind of inspire some, some more thinking and some more action after tonight's event. Um, it was truly a great conversation. Um, so now we're going to move into the final portion of our evening. Um, thanks again to all our panelists, and I'm going to turn it over to Kate. All right. Um, I'm back. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Priya, for, uh, you know, kind of moderating that conversation. Uh, and thank you to all of the panelists, the students and Karen. Um, I'm really glad that I was not a part of that because I was crying a little bit. Um, it was very um, moving and inspiring. And to be completely honest, when I envisioned this project, this is exactly what I had in mind. So you've just made my life tonight, pretty much. So thank you all so much. You know, I think you know, hearing from the from you know young people and you know thinking about what we can do to support people is is so important right now. Um, okay, I'm gonna take a deep breath. <sighs> I know Priya's glad that she doesn't have to talk right now. Um, so with that in mind, we're um, gonna so Sina cuts in. So thinking about this, Sina cuts in is working on compiling a list of resources and actions. Um, that people can take. So if you're watching this and you're wondering how you can support, you know, black farmers um, and other organizations um, run by people of color, um, you know, check out scenicutson.org for more info because we are compiling a list of things that people can do to, to do just that. Um, I also want to make sure to just give a shout out to all of our partners who helped us with this event tonight. Um, we really wouldn't have gotten to where we are today and been able to do this event without um, a lot of a lot of hands. Um, so especially so especially Duchess Community College and all the students who created those beautiful posters. Um, Karen Washington and Rising Root Farm, Newburgh Free Academy's P-Tech program, the teachers and the students there. Um, Kingston YMCA Farm Project, and thank you to Susan for, for getting all the, the students here today and all the students that were here and the students who weren't here, but I, I hope we're listening. Um, and then uh, behind the scenes you don't see, but Tola Brennan and electricwell.co is helping us with all the technology. So um, he's been making all the videos and, and making it look nice for everybody. So thank you to him, he's been a great help. Um, and then last, I'll give a shout out to Envious Sound and Tim McQueen, which um, it will bring us to the next part of our of the evening. So um, I will plug our next events. So this is the first in our summer series. This is our first virtual event. So thank you for being here with us. Um, you can find more information about all of these events if you visit www.cenacutson.org backslash summer. Um, and we'll maybe put that in the, the chats so people can go visit that if you're not there. Um, and we're going to end the night. I'm going to turn it over to DJ Tim McQueen um, and Envious Sound. But with that, I will say to Karen and the students, please hang around. You'll be able to, in our Zoom conversation, hear the music and kind of participate. Uh, we will have to stay muted because we'll be able to be heard. Um, so if you prefer to, to jump off, we can check in, check in later. Um, so with that, I'm going to introduce Tim McQueen. Um, we're really excited to have him here with us tonight. And I will say that this event, originally, we didn't say this in the beginning, which we should have, Priya. Um, we were originally planning to have a celebration and event back in April um, to celebrate the, these posters um, and the students who created the posters. Um, and we were gonna have a, a gallery in the city of Poughkeepsie and we were gonna have Tim McQueen there DJing for us. And so we really didn't wanna miss out on that tonight. Um, although I will say that I think the timing of this is even better now and I, I feel even more proud to be here with the people on the panel um, now than, than ever. Um, so with that, I'm gonna introduce Tim McQueen. Um, Tim McQueen is an active and inspiring member of the Poughkeepsie community. Um, on top of running his own business, Envious Sound, he is a board member of Hudson River Housing and Arts Mid Hudson, and as also an active member of the City of Poughkeepsie Public Arts Commission and Poughkeepsie's First Friday Planning Committee. Through his band, Ill Harmonic, Tim works with Poughkeepsie youth to prepare them for careers in the music industry. Um, his work with Ill Harmonic was actually recognized early in the, er, uh, earlier in this year um, by the Poughkeepsie Journal with the Wager Inclusive Champion Award. Um, and he is gonna be curating some music tonight um, for, for change and healing. So with that, I'm going to pass the mic over to Tim. 
Thanks so much. Thanks so much. I'm happy to be here. You guys put on a wonderful event. Um, shout out to everybody involved, especially, you know, the youth. You guys really, really impressed me with your questions and, you know, and also Karen, just listening to you just got me hyped. So I'm happy to be here. And I guess now we're going to turn on some music. Indicator. 